welcome to the uh, April program, the 34th year of the World War II History Roundtable. A uh, couple of announcements, and I, I want to thank all of you for coming out. It's, uh, we've, we've had an interesting year with dealing with COVID, with snowstorms in November, uh, cold weather, blizzards, uh, curfews, <laughs> riots, and uh, but I would like to just have all of you think back. We are such a lucky people. When we think about our ancestors that came across waters, came across prairies, didn't have a McDonald's every mile or two, uh, didn't have doctors, we're such a damn lucky people. We have thought lots to be thankful for. So let, let's tonight uh, start with that uh, positive affirmation. Um, again, welcome to the 34th year. The, um, the, uh, if any of you are new, uh, at the sign up, or at the t book selling table, we have a sign up table. S sign in to be on our mailing list. I'll talk about that momentarily. And also be sure and pick up one of the uh, newsletters. On the back of it, <clears throat> you'll notice in the calendar, is the schedule of dates for next year. So the, uh, the round tab is an important document besides talking about uh, the events of, of our topic this evening. It uh, gives you an outline of our program for next year. And uh, I'll talk more about that. But Axel, would you like to talk about books? We have two books from our speaker tonight, John uh, Radzielowski. Unfortunately, they're not on the topic he will be talking about, but they're still interesting books. The main one, something called Frantic Seven. Uh, you may all have heard about the Warsaw Uprising, August, September 1944, when the city fought the uh, Nazi uh, occupiers. Uh, the British flew supplies in at night there was one U.S. mission in the middle of September when uh, basically things weren't looking that good for Warsaw anyway. So, but what John has done is done the research on that one flight and also how it was received because uh, even though it was essentially ineffectual for the weapons, food, and medical supplies that dropped, it left a tremendous impression on the people in Poland. The other book that John wrote a while ago is a little one here from the Hopkins. Oh, I'm sorry, did I get that? I should know better. I used to work in computers. <laughs> anyway, the other one is a sh short little book that he wrote uh, some time ago on Poles in Minnesota. So we have both of those books out there. Please come out and see us afterwards. Thanks. Tonight, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about the start of World War II, and uh, there are several people in the audience. I, I know the, the Fishers are here. I think Bob McPartland. You're going to see some, uh, uh, some pictures in the slides of places that we visited three years ago, the post office in Gdansk and the, um, the, the German uh, ship firing in the, in the uh, Bay of... Uh, of Gdansk, so uh, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Bill Kwasny. Bill, you're going to introduce John Radzilowski. Let's start the program. Dobry wieczór. Szanowny Państwo, witam serdecznie. Nazywam się Bolesław Kwasny, Bill Kwasny. Nie mówię dobrze po polsku, trochę mówię po polsku. So with that, I'll switch into English to introduce our speaker tonight. John Radzilowski is originally from Southern Minnesota. His academic career took him to Arizona State University where he obtained a PhD in history. He is currently a professor of history at the University of Alaska. John is the author of numerous books and articles on US and Polish history, including Frantic Seven, Poles in Minnesota, and Traveler's History of Poland. With that, I'll give you John Rezolowski. Thank you very much, Bill. 
Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, thank you so much to the World War II Roundtable for, uh, for hosting uh, tonight, uh, the Minnesota Historical Society, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, we will give you a little slideshow here, I hope. Okay, very good. Well, on uh, September the 1st, 1939, uh, Nazi Germany attacked Poland, initiating the most terrible war in history. And despite countless books and articles devoted to every aspect of the war, most World War II histories give very little information about the invasion of Poland, and what does appear is often completely wrong. Much of this fake news uh, came directly from Nazi propaganda, but was repeated and embellished uh, by Western authors and Soviet propagandists. Uh, so during the Cold War, the language barriers and the failures of the Western democracies to confront the totalitarian threat in the 30s and early 40s uh, meant that the Polish defensive war of 1939 and its role in shaping the conflict that followed was largely erased from history. The September campaign, as it's often known in Poland, is the story of an impoverished and largely agrarian country attacked by two of the most ruthless and powerful totalitarian states in history. The goal of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union was to destroy Poland as a nation, to destroy its culture and its people. Prior to the attack uh, in 1939, Adolf Hitler calls together his generals uh, and, and gives them the instructions, kill without pity or mercy all men, women, and children of Polish descent or language. Only in this way can we achieve the living space we need. And the crimes committed against Polish citizens, both Jewish and non-Jewish, beggar the imagination even to this day. But this is also the story of the first nation to stand up to Adolf Hitler's drive to dominate Europe and to create a totalitarian utopia based upon race. In resisting, the Poles sought not only to defend themselves, but to draw the Western powers into the fight against Germany. The Poles fought against long odds in 1939, but as we'll see, it was a struggle that would not cease even in the face of defeat. From 1939 to 1945, Poles fulfilled the, uh, the image of uh, the, the Greek uh, goddess Nemesis. They followed the Nazis wherever they went, every front uh, in the Second World War and every corner of the world, uh, the, the Poles continued to fight uh, the, the forces of the Third Reich. And so by better understanding uh, the September campaign, the beginning of the war in Poland, uh, we really uh, gives us a much better insight into how the war was conducted uh, and, and many, of the, many of the key events uh, in the war. But to begin with, we kind of have to talk a little bit about Poland, which is a subject that perhaps is not as familiar to Americans uh, as perhaps it should be, uh, but uh, in the period between the two world wars. Uh, Poland uh, regained its independence in 1918 after 123 years of uh, foreign colonial rule, uh, when Poland was under the rule of uh, the Russians, uh, the Prussians, the Germans, and the Austrians. Uh, during World War I, uh, these three empires collapsed Russia due to uh, uh, revolution and Austria, Austria Hungary, and uh, Germany to defeat, uh, and uh, Poland is able to restore its independence. Uh, but the World War I had a devastating impact on the country. Uh, much of the war on the Eastern Front was fought in, uh, in, on Polish land. Uh, and then uh, there were several years, or th about three years, of German and Austrian occupation, which stripped the country of much of its resources uh, and, and left it absolutely devastated. Uh, the Poles then had to fight a series of border wars against many of their neighbors, the largest being the uh, the, the Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1920, uh, when Lenin unleashes the Red Army on Poland in an effort to spread communist revolution uh, from Russia into, uh, into Europe. Uh, this uh, attempt is defeated uh, by uh, Polish forces led by Józef Piłsudski uh, in predicting the Battle of Warsaw in 1920, uh, which secures Polish independence for the next 20, uh, almost 20 years. But the country that emerged was a very poor country, very impoverished country, uh, not only devastated by war, but also by disease and famine. Uh, and and uh, that recovery from the war was very, very long and very slow. It was a country that uh, was ethnically mixed, uh, about two thirds of the population, uh, ethnically Polish, uh, but also large uh, uh, populations of Ukrainians, uh, large Jewish population, about 10%. 
uh, Belarusians, there were also German, Lithuanian, many, many other groups uh, living in Poland at that time. Now, uh, we'll talk mainly about the, the, the Polish defensive preparations, but one of, the, one of the, main, the main threat to Poland during the interwar period was the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, this really shaped Poland's perceptions of how to defend itself. Uh, and uh, it, had, it had conflicts with a number of its neighbors. Uh, the Poles had quite good relations with the, the Romanians and the Latvians uh, to the north and the south. Uh, good relations with the Hungarians uh, going back uh, quite some time. Uh, but very frosty relations with Czechoslovakia to the south uh, and Lithuania, in particular Lithuania to the north, which was the result of those border conflicts that had occurred at the end of the First World War. Now, uh, Poland also obviously faced a threat from Germany, but until the rise of Adolf Hitler, uh, German forces were uh, constrained by the Versailles Treaty. Uh, and while the Germans dreamed of regaining uh, territory from Poland, uh, they didn't really have the means to achieve that in, until, the, until the 1930s. But the cornerstone of uh, the Polish strategy through the interwar period was its alliance with France. Uh, and uh, this was the, uh, the keystone for Polish foreign policy, not only protected against the Soviet Union, but also potentially against Germany. In 1933, as we know, Adolf Hitler rises to power in, uh, in Germany. Uh, and at that time, Josef Pilsudski, uh, who uh, was the uh, leader of Poland, uh, sometimes from behind the scenes, uh, but he was the, uh, the, the most important leader in Poland, proposes to uh, the, the French a joint operation between Polish and French forces to remove Hitler from power and restore the Weimar Republic. The French refuse. Um, this is, this, the French, this sounds like crazy warmongering uh, and um, what possible threat could, could Hitler be? Um, uh, another, another, unfortunate, another unfortunate mistake. Well, with the rise of Hitler, Polish strategy has to change. It has to adapt. Uh, and uh, uh, so we'll look a little bit at the structure of the Polish armed forces uh, that, that are going to confront uh, the threat at the start of the war. One of the great myths about the Polish army uh, during this period is the, the Poles relied on, on their cavalry. Uh, this is one of the, the, the things you often see in Western history. And this is certainly not the case. The backbone of the Polish army was an, it was an infantry army. And the Polish army, uh, as it started the second, the start of the Second World War, uh, in its, its sort of first uh, main mobilization, would mobilize about one million men. Uh, and this was the, the core of this was a, a, a group of about thirty infantry divisions. Uh, there were ten cavalry brigades. Uh, that was also an important part of the Polish armed forces. It did attract quite a few, uh, quite a few good recruits. Uh, but only about 10% of the Polish armed forces was horse cavalry. How does this compare? Now, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about the 1930s, 1939, not 1944. Um, so we have to think about what other countries at that time had. Uh, so 10% of the Polish armed forces were horse cavalry. That's roughly comparable to what the French had. The Germans had about 5%. Uh, the U.S. had more than, in 1939, had more than 10% horse cavalry. Uh, so Poland was certainly not unique among the, the different powers of Europe in terms of uh, having cavalry. Uh, the cavalry were uh, forces that were, they were not, and one of the, one of the myths is the Polish cavalry was charging into German tanks. The cavalry, cavalry doctrine in Poland uh, emphasized fighting dismounted. So the cavalry acted as a kind of mobile infantry. Uh, and they didn't carry lances, by the way, in, in the combat either. But the other function of the cavalry was to help defend the eastern borderlands uh, facing the Soviet Union. And this was an area of a very, very poorly developed, or the poorest area of the country, uh, very poorly developed road net. In the late 1930s, uh, unlike a little bit later on in the war as uh, armored forces and vehicle, vehicle technology develops very rapidly during the war, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the military vehicles of the late 30s had very poor off-road capabilities. Uh, Eastern Poland uh, was a land of uh, forests and marshes and mountains. Uh, and so in, this, in that kind of terrain, cavalry could be very effective uh, because uh, they wouldn't suffer some of the problems. And so uh, the cavalry were kept on, but as we'll also see, there was a, also a budgetary issue that the Poles faced. They did begin to mechanize some of their cavalry, and there would be two brigades uh, that were mechanized by the time of the start of the war. But as we see, uh, that there were some some glitches with that. 
Uh, the polls also fielded a, a Navy, uh, an Air Force. Uh, the, the picture you see here of the ship uh, is the, uh, the destroyer Buiscovica or Lightning uh, at the uh, uh, it's a museum ship. It's still it's still a commissioned warship. Uh, this was one of the original Polish destroyers from the from the 1930s, uh, and fought alongside Allied forces throughout the war. Uh, and uh, the Polish Poland had a very short coastline, uh, really uh, uh, just an area around G uh, Gdynia and uh, and and the Hill Peninsula. Uh, and so, in in a conflict with Germany, the, the, the navy was not expected to uh, play an important role. The Navy was built to confront the Soviet Union. Uh, so Soviet ships would be coming out of the uh, out of uh, Leningrad, uh, Petersburg, uh, and the, the Polish Navy was designed to harass or contain that threat, uh, but not to to face off against uh, Germany. Uh, the Poles had a pretty well developed air force, uh, and uh, that Poland was one of the first countries to convert from biplane fighters uh, to. Uh, to, all, to an all-metal air force. Uh, pilot training was excellent. Uh, the Polish pilots throughout the Second World War would, would prove themselves again and again, not only in 1939, but in subsequent battles in, uh, in 1940 uh, and afterwards. Uh, but uh, as we'll see, weapons acquisition was sometimes, sometimes delayed uh, because of budgetary issues that the Poles had, but aircraft design and aircraft training, uh, pilot training was, was really, uh, really top rate for the Poles. Uh, and they really did, um, uh, as we'll see, do, do very, very well, even if they didn't always have the equipment uh, to, uh, to back, uh, back up the skill of their pilots. Now the Polish army armed forces have both strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so it's important to kind of talk about both of those. Uh, and the Poles had a number of weaknesses. One of these was in artillery. They lacked artillery, uh, particularly heavy artillery, to support their ground forces, particularly compared to the Germans. Um, and this was a, a concern the Poles had been addressing uh, in their modernization plan, uh, but uh, they, they, didn't, they did, had not reached uh, the point where they needed to be by the start of the war. Now, uh, uh, another very important problem that the Poles have is command and control. Uh, there's a lack of radios uh, the Poles have. They rely on field telephones is another weakness. But on top of that, there was a problem with staff planning. The, the, head, of the head of the Polish armed forces until his death in 1935 uh, was Josef Pilsudski, a uh, marshal of Poland. He'd won the great victory over the Soviets. Now, Pilsudski was a very uh, capable politician, very capable commander, but he was not a particularly good manager. So uh, did very well in wartime, but when it came to peacetime management of the armed forces, uh, he did not do nearly as well. Uh, and he created a very odd system, a two-track system to run the army, one for a wartime track, another peacetime track. Uh, and so this uh, tended to uh, exacerbate some of the problems of staff planning uh, and also command and control. He was also very unfortunate in the choice of his successor, uh, he got cancer in 1935, uh, his health began to fail, uh, and he appointed as his successor, uh, Marshal Ed Edward Ridge Schmigwe, uh, who was, had been a very capable subordinate of Pilsudski's, uh, been one of his divisional commanders, uh, certainly a, a patriot, uh, a personally courageous, uh, but not well cut out to command in modern armed forces. And we'll see as we start to talk about the campaign a little bit more in detail, uh, some of these weaknesses are going to come out in, uh, in spades. Uh, now, the Poles do have a number of strengths, however. Their army is well trained. It's very motivated. Despite some problems with its top command, they have a very solid officer corps, a uh, very good uh, corps of NCOs, especially uh, junior officers. Uh, tra the training had been very good. Uh, the Poles have uh, very excellent intelligence. American uh, intelligence officials uh, during the war, uh, General Croner, uh, who was the uh, intel intelligence chief for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 1943-1944, um, uh, said that the Poles had the best intelligence service of any Allied army in the Second World War. Uh, and that would benefit uh, both Poland uh, in, at the start of the war, but also the Allied cause throughout, uh, throughout the conflict. Uh, they had some specialized units, and one of these was the Border Protection Corps, the Border Defense Corps, uh, in the, uh, use the, the Polish abbreviation KOP, 
Uh, and throughout the 1930s, uh, the Soviets would send uh, agents across the border. They'd send armed groups uh, to harass civilians uh, and attack, uh, create chaos. Uh, and the border police, normal border guards couldn't handle this. So they created a special force um, and we might describe this as if we are thinking about modern terms as a force devoted to low intensity warfare. Uh, so small unit tactics, uh, counter, uh, counter penetration, uh, intelligence gathering uh, was a very well-trained force. Uh, and this would defend the Eastern border then as the conflict with Germany heats up, uh, the, the Nazi regime will attempt the same, the same tactics on the, on the Western border and the border defense corps will be tasked with trying to prevent that. Now, uh, in the late uh, 1930s, like many countries, Poland begins a modernization program, uh, begins in 1936. Uh, and uh, a lot of other countries, if we're thinking, one of the myths about the Polish armed forces was that they were completely antiquated, they had completely antiquated equipment. This is not true. Uh, Polish equipment was on a par with most what other European countries had in the late 1930s. Uh, and certainly on, on the par with what, what the French had. And they had some uh, weapon systems that were really excellent. Uh, one of them, uh, the 7TP tank, uh, was, a, was a light tank, uh, superior in, uh, in, in pretty much every aspect to the German Panzer I or Panzer II, uh, which were at that time the, the most numerous uh, German battle tanks, uh, equal or superior to the Soviet T-26, which was the, the main, the main, his main Soviet counterpart. The Poles put a lot of emphasis on anti-tank warfare. Um, and this is one of the things, again, as we're talking about the, the myths, uh, one of the myths is the German tanks has kind of rolled through Poland without any opposition. So we'll see this is not true at all. Uh, and they had some very good uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, the Bofors 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, which we'll talk a little bit about, but they also had probably the, probably the only effective anti-tank weapon fielded by any, any army in the Second World War. Uh, was the, mo the Model 35 uh, anti-tank rifle. Uh, they had some excellent aircraft design, uh, the, the uh, P, uh, PZL-37 Wash medium bomber, probably the best medium bomber uh, in, uh, fielded in, in 1930, uh, in the 1930s and early 40s, uh, superior to its, uh, to its Western counterparts, probably equal, uh, equal in terms of performance to the German Henkel 111 uh, at half the weight. Uh, it was very lightweight, uh, very fast, at a higher, higher ceiling uh, than the um, uh, than, than the Henkel, uh, and superior, to, uh, very superior to the, to the Dorner uh, 17, which were the, the, the two the two main German types. Uh, so the Poles had excellent weapons. The problem was they didn't have the budget to acquire the weapons right away, and so their six-year modernization plan. Uh, called for the, uh, a lot of the acquisition of particularly new fighters uh, to be in the latter half of the modernization plan. That would be from 1940 to 42. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Now, I, I, keep, I keep mentioning poverty. I keep mentioning the budget. What was the difference between defense spending in, say, Germany uh, prior to the war and Poland? Uh, well, to give you an example, in the polls, sacrificed a lot to, to build up their armed forces. It wasn't like they weren't spending money, but uh, the German Luftwaffe had a budget 10 times larger than the entire Polish defense spending uh, in, in prior to the war. So to give you some idea of the disparity uh, in terms of resources between the two countries. So this is a country that is uh, impoverished, uh, is struggling in a sense to, to develop uh, its armed forces uh, and so when we look at 19, the, the events of 1939, uh, we have to uh, see it in that light. Now, as I mentioned, one of the, one of the uh, uh, truly important uh, contributions to the Allied cause uh, was the breaking of the German military codes. Uh, and this is, in a, the British called it ultra, so-called ultra secret, uh, associated with Bletchley Park. But this really began in Poland in the 1930s. Uh, and the Poles uh, were considered some of the world's best code breakers. They'd broken the Soviet codes, uh, actually, uh, not only in 1920, but actually during World War II as well. They, they, they broke at least some Soviet codes. Uh, in the, and and the, the Poles, prior to the, the, the German attack, had identified at least 90% of the major German units facing them, uh, their, their disposition and location. Uh, so the, 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 the Poles really had very good intelligence. Knowing what the where the enemy is, knowing their intentions doesn't necessarily help you to stop them. 
But in the late 1920s, uh, the, the Germans converted to a machine encoding system for their military communication known as Enigma. And the Germans considered this system to be unbreakable. Uh, it used the mechanical uh, scrambling, it's, uh, it scrambled the messages. Uh, and so even if you were able to decipher one set of messages, it didn't necessarily help you decipher other messages uh, because the, uh, uh, the, the internal wiring of, of the machine uh, made that impossible. Um, so normal code breaking efforts failed. And this is why the Germans considered really throughout the war unbreakable. Uh, when the, confronted by this, and, and the Poles had been reading German communications throughout the 1920s, uh, when the Germans uh, switched to, uh, to the new system in 29, uh, the, the Poles are stumped. Uh, and so they take a different approach to code breaking. Instead of the traditional uh, pencil and paper method, uh, they recruit a number of young mathematicians from the University of Poznań, uh, particularly Mar Marian Rayevsky. Uh, and Rayevsky is able, and I, I don't understand the mathematics, so uh, you'll... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, can't, uh, I can't describe it in the detail that I should, but essentially using higher algebraic formula, uh, Rayevsky is able to reverse engineer uh, the internal wiring of the, the, the Enigma rotors, which would have been the key problem. And once he does that, the Poles are able to unlock the Enigma secret. So between about 1933 and the end of 1938, the Poles are able to read most of the German military, or the secret military communications, at least done by radio. Uh, in 1938, during the Munich crisis, uh, the Germans add additional rotors to the Enigma machine. Uh, this has the effect of making it 10 times harder to decipher the messages. Uh, and so Rayevsky and his colleagues uh, create something called the Bomba, uh, which is a kind of proto-computer. It's actually several Enigma machines wired together to, to calculate out the codes. In, in 1939, and Two months before the start of the war, uh, the Poles invite uh, the French and uh, British counterparts to a secret meeting outside of Warsaw where they provide them with all the information and two working copies of the Bomba. And this would become the start of uh, what the, uh, the British would operate at Bletchley Park uh, throughout the war, uh, which would give the, the Allies a key, uh, a key advantage during the, uh, uh, during the conflict. So what was the strategic situation and how did the Poles uh, respond to that? Of course, uh, beginning uh, 1936 uh, through the Anschluss with Austria, uh, the, uh, Hitler wins a series of bloodless victories, the most important of which was the takeover of Czechoslovakia uh, with, with the help, unfortunately, of the Western allies. Uh, and uh, uh, this in greatly increases the, the threat to Poland. In uh, March of 39, uh, the Germans began to threaten the Poles over the city of Danzig, uh, which was a, a free city. Uh, it had independent government, but was in customs union with Poland uh, and other, also other territories in the West. Now, the Polish defensive plan uh, is, is, fairly, is fairly straightforward. Uh, the key is to draw the French and the Germans into the fight. But of course, as they saw with Czechoslovakia, even though Czechoslovakia had an alliance with the French, the French did not honor the alliance and they let the, uh, hung the Czechs out to dry, even though the Czechs had actually an excellent armed army uh, and uh, were well prepared to fight against the Germans. Uh, and so uh, part of the Polish plan involves ensuring that Hitler can't uh, come in and seize Danzig, seize other territories, uh, and then declare the war over. Uh, the, the key is to engage German forces as they cross the border to make sure there's no doubt that this is a full-fledged war uh, and the French and later the British would have to honor those pacts. So the idea is to have forces forward near the border and then stage a gradual withdrawal to the southeast. In the southeast uh, portion of the country near the Romanian border, the Poles had positioned additional supplies. Romania was a friendly country. By withdrawing to the southeast, uh, they would gradually constrict their, um, uh, their, their, their defensive lines. They would continue to be resupplied through, uh, through Romania. And uh, it, within two and a half to three weeks, the French promised a full offensive on the west. Uh, and then they would simply have to wait for the French armies to crash through the, through the German lines uh, in, in the west. Now, there's a number of flaws with this, uh, one of which uh, was uh, that Polish forces are less mobile uh, than the Germans. Uh, they don't have enough motorized forces. Uh, in fact, there's only about, uh, 20, about 24,000 civilian cars and trucks in the entire country. 
uh, and this is one of the constraints on modernization, uh, was if you at the Pol Polish government had confiscated all the civilian vehicles in the country, uh, they could have motorized one division. Uh, so again, uh, their forces move much more slowly, and as we'll see, this is one of the flaws in the defensive plan. Uh, but the, the most of all, they wanted to avoid the Czech scenario, uh, where the Germans were able to take over territory, quickly border territory, uh, and not have the West uh, uh, join in. Uh, of course, uh, the most upsetting uh, event uh, in, in the lead up to the war is the Nazi-Soviet uh, Pact, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, which has secret protocols, as we now know, uh, to partition Poland and other parts of Eastern Europe between the two totalitarian powers. Uh, but at the time, the Poles couldn't worry about uh, uh, the Soviets. The, the, the German threat was uh, was was very uh, really the, the most important the most important part. And, uh, on the 25th of August, uh, Britain gives firm security guarantees to Poland. Now Hitler had planned to attack, uh, start his attack on the 25th of August. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the British guarantees uh, uh, cause Hitler to blink. Uh, he, he, halts, he halts the plans for the invasion. And unfortunately for, for some German units, uh, they didn't get the, uh, the message until they crossed the border. A number of small uh, German detachments crossed the border and began their attack on the 25th. Uh, and they're mostly cut off and destroyed. Uh, a few managed to scurry back across the border. Uh, but uh, uh, Hitler then uh, uh, sort of regathers himself uh, and uh, plans, plans the invasion for the, for the 1st of September. Now, this is the basic outline of the, the German plan. Uh, they didn't quite follow this. Uh, all plans tend to uh, fall apart uh, on the contact with the enemy, as they say. Uh, the idea was to win the war within two weeks, uh, to defeat the Poles and then turn uh, to, to face the French. Uh, the Poles will be outnumbered uh, two to one in men and artillery, three to one in aircraft and, and uh, uh, armored fighting vehicles. Now, on the 25th uh, of, of, uh, of August, the Poles declare mobilization. But the French intervene at this point. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the sort of critical and perhaps most tragic parts of the whole story uh, is that the French uh, demand that the Poles stop their mobilization. Uh, they don't want to provoke Hitler. Uh, and so, um, in fact, they, they threatened to withhold uh, aid to, to Poland. Uh, and so the Poles stopped them because, again, the key is to get the French into the fight. Uh, and so they, they, they need, so they, they have to stop their mobilization. They try to restart the French intervene again. It's not until the 30th of August that the Poles declare mobilization. It's, and you can go in the pages of the New York Times uh, during this last week of August of 39, and there are photographs all over the New York Times uh, showing you know, German lines and German tanks, and, uh, soldiers marching up to the border. Uh, it was quite clear to everyone who could read a newspaper that, that Hitler had his full, uh, his, his full forces on the Polish border. Uh, but unfortunately, what this means for the Poles is that uh, they, they don't get all their forces in place. Uh, before the start of the war. Uh, less than half the Polish armed forces are in place and fully equipped uh, on September the 1st. Uh, and, th and, and this will be a, a, fatal, a fatal problem uh, for the Poles. Now on September the 1st, uh, uh, 1939, at 4.45 in the morning, uh, the war begins. The battleship, uh, training battleship, Cheshwi Holstein, uh, which has been on a a so-called courtesy visit to Danzig uh, opens fire on the, the Westerplatz Peninsula. Uh, Westerplatz was one of two locations within the free city of, of Danzig that were under direct Polish control. And, uh, Westerplatz had been a, um, a military transit depot designed to allow the Poles to bring in military supplies uh, onto Polish uh, soil and then ship them to Poland uh, and it was manned by a garrison of about 182 men, uh, and uh, so a very small garrison. And the Poles also have an extraterritorial post office, uh, which is uh, defended by a small group of reservists and, uh, and postal workers. Uh, and the, one of the great myths about the September campaign is that the Poles were surprised. This was a surprise attack. Uh, certainly not the case. Uh, the Germans did attempt a number of operations to seize bridges and tunnels of uh, strategic importance. Uh, so for example, south of, of Gdańsk, uh, the city of Chev, uh, an important uh, bridge over the Vistula River, 
uh, German commandos uh, commandeer a train, a uh, regular mail train that was going through a uh, peacetime train. They put a special armored car. Uh, and the idea is that the bridge is wired for, for demolition. Uh, they'll jump out, seize the bridge uh, before the Poles can blow it. Uh, but Polish railway workers uh, spot the, uh, the suspect car. They telephone ahead to the uh, Polish troops uh, manning the bridge. And when the German commandos jump off, they're, they're met by a hail of machine gun fire, driven back, and the Poles blow the bridges. So uh, none of the, none of the, even the, the sort of smaller uh, operations meant to surprise the Poles at that. Uh, the Sheshwig Holstein opens fire on Westerplatte uh, and its huge shells uh, uh, seem to pulverize the peninsula. Uh, it's followed up by an attack by uh, Danzig SS forces, uh, but they're met by the Polish garrison. The Poles had secretly constructed uh, a series of makeshift defenses on the peninsula uh, and had stockpiled some supplies. Uh, and so the uh, SS attack is met with heavy fire and driven back. Uh, a second attack by uh, Marine stormtroopers from the uh, from the battleship is likewise driven back with heavy losses. Uh, Vesterplatte was expected to hold out uh, for uh, about a day, uh, but uh, it actually ended up holding out for uh, for uh, about a week uh, before it finally finally surrenders. Uh, the Germans called it Little Verdun uh, because of the heavy losses that they took. Now, one of the one of the enduring myths about uh, the September campaign, uh, and, and this this is the the start of the, the first phase of the conflict is something we call the Battle of the Border. This conflict is German forces cross the border the first couple of days. The great myth about the September campaign is the Polish cavalry charged German tanks. And you read about this all the time, and still, still to this day, well, most historians know better. Uh, you, you still see this from time to time. Uh, and but it's so interesting to look at what an actual encounter between uh, Polish cavalry and uh, uh, and German Panzers would be. Uh, and on the first of September, the Battle of Mokra, uh, the, the German Fourth Panzer Division, backed up by the Thirty First Infantry Division and some other elements, runs into the Wolinska Cavalry Brigade, uh, which is defending the village of Mokra uh, near Częstochowa. Uh, and uh, the, the Poles are uh, set up in a wooded location uh, just beyond the border. Uh, and uh, concealed around the village of Mokra in, in, in a series of woods. Uh, among, the, uh, among the soldiers of the 21st Ulan Regiment is a young man named Marian Wojciechowski, a young lieutenant, who I had the, the honor to know and to interview uh, about the battle and other, his other experiences. Uh, he described for me some of the events of the battle uh, and uh, he was in charge of an anti-tank gun section, one of the Bofor 37 millimeter anti-tank guns that was concealed within the woods. Uh, and he, he described how the German tanks began to approach, and they, they didn't know that the, they, they thought some of the Polish positions in the, uh, in the woods, and so they started lobbing shells into the, into the woods as they began to approach, uh, firing into the woods, trying to provoke a response uh, to, to uncover the Polish positions. And his orders were to keep his men, so that was the hardest part of the whole battle, was to keep his men from firing too soon, uh, because he had orders to let the German tanks get very, very close. Uh, and so the tanks uh, get to within 500 meters. Uh, they still can't fire. Uh, his men are itching to, 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 to return fire. And as the, uh, as, as the Germans get no response, they get more confident. They begin to advance more, more quickly. They reach 150 meters from his position and they're ordered to open fire. Uh, and it's very close range. Uh, tanks start to go up left and right. Uh, and uh, the, the Germans fall back a couple hundred meters. Uh, but they're still within range of the Polish guns and more tanks are knocked out. Uh, they eventually withdraw uh, out of Polish range, leaving their infantry uh, pinned down in, in the open field. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the, the first attacks happen uh, seven, uh, what he described to me happened about seven or eight in the morning. Uh, and um, at about 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, and, and the Polish positions are in the woods, they're backed up by an elevated train track. Uh, that runs behind the positions, and they have some some reserves on the other side of the of the tracks. Uh, at about ten at about ten a.m., uh, the Germans launch another major attack, uh, and uh, over hundred uh, over hundred tanks and armored cars uh, break through the positions of the 19th Uhlans to the north of Marion's position, uh, and they begin to cross into the woods and cross the uh, the elevated the elevated rail line. 
Um, it's at this time that a Polish armor train, armor train 53, uh, comes rolling down the tracks. You have to imagine a large train with a locomotive in the middle uh, and, and heavy gun turrets uh, and uh, uh, he heavily, heavily armored machine gun uh, turrets. Um, and the Germans are halfway across the tracks. The train rolls right in the middle of the German column as they're crossing the tracks. And it's guns firing to either side. Uh, German attack uh, 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 falls apart in confusion uh, and, the, and, the, uh, and they have to retreat back to their positions. The Poles are able to counterattack and reestablish their, their position. Uh, the Germans attack again at noon, uh, two hours later, uh, backed up by dive bombers and artillery. And again, they're repelled. At 1,500 hours, about three o'clock in the afternoon, 180 uh, German tanks and armored fighting vehicles come crashing through the Polish positions into Mokra, um, and then once again, crossing the rail line. The armor train had moved away and uh, was supporting another position. It comes back again uh, and begins to pick off the German tanks. Uh, and th at this point, the Germans have had enough. The number of tanks have got up onto the rail line. Uh, there's only a few places on the rail line they could cross. Uh, they get hit, they start on fire. Some tanks get trapped on the, on the opposite side of the rail line. Uh, the Germans begin uh, firing at each other. The tanks begin to crash into each other. Uh, a number of the Panzer crews basically abandon their vehicles and run back to the uh, uh, to, to German lines. Um, and so each time you, you hear, you read that uh, the account of the supposed cavalry charge, uh, you can think about the Battle of Mokra. Uh, and there were, this was not the only such encounter. Uh, the Germans uh, suffered quite, as we'll see, quite a few heavy equipment losses. Another great myth about the um, campaign is the Polish Air Force was destroyed on the first day of the war. Uh, this is not true. Uh, this is the, the only remaining Polish fighter from 1939. It's a, it's a P-11. Uh, it was definitely outdated. Uh, the, the Poles had a number of problems uh, getting, a, getting, a front line, getting their frontline fighters upgraded. Uh, this was uh, much slower than the German aircraft, but more maneuverable. Uh, in the hands of good pilots, uh, it could score kills even in even a dogfight with an ME-109. Not easy to do, but it was possible. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, German att attempts to attack Warsaw are driven back, the bombers are driven off. Um, and uh, for the first five to six days of the campaign, the Polish Air Force is able to hold their own. Uh, by the fifth or sixth day, however, they begin to uh, equipment losses uh, and, uh, and combat losses, uh, and just simply the, uh, the, the loss of bases as the Germans advance uh, begins to uh, harm the, the Polish Air Force. Almost no German Polish aircraft were destroyed, at least operational aircraft were destroyed on the ground, uh, unlike again what, uh, what we often hear. By September the 3rd, uh, German forces are beginning to break through. These are the sort of next few phases of the campaign. Um, and the problem the Poles had had with mobilization, uh, a lot of their forces didn't connect up with it and couldn't present a continuous front because a lot of their forces were still uh, in transit. Uh, and so um, the German armored forces, when they run up against positions like Mokra, they, they suffer heavy losses, but the advantage to the armored forces is that they are mobile and they begin to discover the gaps between the Polish forces and they begin to outflank them uh, and, and push them back. By the 3rd of September, Army Wuchla, which had defended the key sector in the center, uh, loses contact with its neighboring forces to the north and the south. And it's pushed back and German armored spearheads begin to, to break through uh, toward Warsaw. Uh, and some of them uh, begin to reach Warsaw by about the 5th of, of September, they're approaching the city. Uh, at this point, the, the, the high command loses its nerve and, uh, and, and Marshal Rid Smigwi decides to move the headquarters of the high command uh, back to the Southeast uh, very prematurely. Uh, this causes a lot of confusion. He loses contact with a lot of his field armies. Uh, and it really increases the, the problems that the Poles have. Uh, and so uh, uh, really puts himself out of the, out of the action. So the Pol Polish high command is really out of the action uh, for, for some time thereafter. Um, and so the, the Poles are unable to contain uh, the, the German advance. However, the Germans have their own problems. And one of those is in, uh, intelligence failures. Uh, the Germans did not have good intelligence. Poles had better intelligence on the Germans than was the reverse. And uh, during this phase of the campaign, the Germans lose track of a number of the major Polish field armies. And in particular, they lose track of Army Poznań and Army Pomerania, uh, which are north uh, and, and west of Warsaw. 
And these armies are under the command of uh, General Tadeusz Kostrzeba, uh, sorry, uh, who is probably one of the most capable uh, Polish field commanders. Uh, and Kostrzeba has uh, um, anticipated this, this exact scenario. He, he's planned for this. Uh, and so as German forces are advancing toward Warsaw, um, they don't know there's a huge Polish army just to their north. They don't protect their flanks. Uh, and uh, Kuszczeba sends his forces on a counterattack against the weak flank of the German advance. Um, this begins the, 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 the Battle of Jura uh, in, uh, on, the, on the 9th of September uh, and uh, forces the uh, Germans to pull back their advance. Uh, and the Poles make uh, significant gains. They, they, they capture a significant number of German forces, uh, retake a number of important towns. But again, the advantage that the Germans have is their forces are more mobile. Uh, and so they're able to pull back from Warsaw, regroup, uh, and concentrate on this counterattack, on stopping the counterattack. Um, and it's in this period, this first era, this, uh, the first 10 days, when Poles suffer very heavy losses. As they're retreating, their forces are vulnerable to air attack in particular, uh, and, and they suffer very, very, very heavy losses as a result. Uh, Khrushchev's counterattack is defeated uh, in a five-day battle. Uh, both sides suffering heavy losses, uh, but what it does is it allows the Poles to, uh, Polish defenses to regroup. Um, and one of the myths, again, about the campaign is that uh, the, the fighting was over after two weeks or three weeks, but in fact, German losses peaked during the third week of the campaign. So the Germans are suffering their heaviest losses after the 14th of September. Uh, and again, this is sort of counter to, to the myths that we've heard um, and in particular, around a number of bastions in the north of the seacoast of the city of Warsaw and in the southeast, around the city, uh, grouped around the city of Lwów, uh, Polish defenses begin to stiffen. Uh, in Warsaw, even though the, the high command is left, uh, Mayor Stefan Starzynski uh, and General Valerian Schuma rallied the defenders. Uh, civilians begin to build the field defenses around the city, uh, creating a series of makeshift fortifications uh, around Warsaw. Uh, the Germans launch a number of attacks into the city, all of which are defeated, uh, and they have to settle in, settle in for a longer siege. Um, it's also during this period when they, a lot of the heaviest bombing of civilian targets uh, occurs. Uh, the Luftwaffe had been very, very effective against Polish supply columns, but a lot of the Luftwaffe um, missions were against civilian targets. They target hospitals, they target churches, uh, and there are a number of well-documented cases of German air crews uh, machine gunning people uh, uh, working out in the fields, farmers digging, people digging potatoes out of the field are, are attacking even individual farmers, uh, you know, German aircraft are hunting them down in the fields. Uh, and this is actually documented by American journalist uh, Julian Bryant, who's actually later able to smuggle uh, his photographs out uh, to the West. Uh, but this is uh, uh, this, this, brief, this brief ray of hope however, is quickly extinguished on the 17th of September uh, when uh, Soviet forces uh, attack from the east. Uh, Stalin sends about 600,000 uh, Red Army forces into eastern Poland uh, in, uh, in, in help of his, his German allies. Uh, and uh, the Poles have stripped pretty much all their troops out of the east to face the German threat. Uh, there's a few forces left um, and they don't surrender. Um, and um, a lot of the problems, if, if you re if we remember the, the Finnish campaign uh, and the heavy losses that the, uh, the, the Red Army suffers in Finland, um, if, you, if you look at the, the fighting that went on uh, during this period with the Red Army, you begin to see um, uh, the hints of what's going to happen in Finland in, in a few months' time, uh, because you have very large Soviet forces attacking minuscule Polish forces. Um, one of the best examples was the defense of the Sarni bunkers. Uh, this was a fortified area near the town of Sarni in eastern Poland. Uh, and uh, uh, it's defended by a, a scratch group of 50, uh, a from 50 men under the leadership of Lieutenant Jan Bobot, whose picture is here. Um, these are the soldiers of the Border Defense Corps. Um, they're confronted by the 60th Rifle Division uh, of the Red Army, uh, supported by, by uh, at least one tank brigade, possibly two. Uh, and they're, so they're outnumbered about 200 to one. Uh, surrender is, however, not an option for the Border Defense Corps. Uh, the Soviets launch a series of human wave attacks on the bunker to try to overwhelm them. And uh, the, uh, uh, you know, they don't even attempt, in many cases, to, uh, to outflank the bunkers. Uh, and, and then the Poles just cut them down as they, as they advance. 
Um, the Soviets also failed to, to cut the communication lines from the bunker. Uh, so Bolbot was in telephone communication with his commander, uh, General Rukerman, uh, who said located several miles away. And he was giving regular reports on the telephone as the Soviets are attacking over a two day period. Uh, on the 20th of, of September in the afternoon, he reports that uh, the, the Soviets have piled up flammable material around his bunker and set it on fire. Uh, so there's smoke pouring into the bunker. Uh, his men put on gas masks. He says they continue to they, they remain in their positions. Uh, he, he, he is a neighboring bunker. He can see through uh, through one of the slits. Uh, you see hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on. At that point, the line goes dead. Uh, and, and that was the last that was heard of the garrison. They all, they all perished in the flames. Uh, but the Soviets suffered, again, very, very heavy losses, uh, in both tanks and in and, uh, uh, and personnel. Now, the great tragedy of 1939, uh, which initiates the partition of East Central Europe uh, between the Soviets and, and, the, and the Germans, is that the French do not attack. Hitler threw his entire, uh, his entire air force, all of his tanks, uh, the majority, all of his frontline infantry uh, into the attack on Poland. Uh, the, the Western border was relatively lightly manned with second rate troops. Uh, the French had a huge advantage uh, but the French do not fulfill their treaty obligations. They do not attack. Um, had they done so, had they attacked vigorously in 1939, uh, perhaps we wouldn't even have to have a World War II roundtable. Um, in addition to that, um, when Polish, uh, Polish forces uh, begin to move to, to France, uh, in, in as, the, as the Soviets uh, began to advance Polish defenses, uh, began to have to fall apart. Uh, there's, they can't defend from both directions. The Polish forces cross into Hungary and into Romania, uh, and which are both fairly sympathetic to the Poles, and they begin to escape uh, to France. Uh, they write up full reports on everything that's happened, every the tactics the Germans use, the weapons they hand it to the French and the British, and they say, "Here's here's how here's what you need to know about what the German army is doing." The French ignore; they, they don't want to listen to the Poles, the losers. Uh, what, what do they know, after all, right? Uh, they'll, they'll they'll deal with the Germans uh, quite quite easily. Uh, this was a very difficult campaign for the German army. Uh, they suffered over 16,000 dead. Uh, and uh, to put that in some perspective, um, the U.S. Uh, are probably our, uh, arguably our toughest military campaign in the Second World War, Battle of Okinawa. Uh, and in the Battle of Okinawa, we lost 12,520 troops. Uh, so the Germans lose more in the battle. Uh, so this idea that the Germans are simply walking over the Poles is not the case. Uh, poll, poll, the Poles lose about 66,000 dead, uh, about 130,000 wounded. Uh, the Germans lose almost 1,000 tanks and armored cars. Uh, so a significant portion of the German armed forces uh, 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 armored capability is, is severely damaged. Uh, this is one of the reasons they, they end up waiting uh, so, so production can, uh, uh, can, can uh, recoup some of those losses. Uh, by 1940, this is why they, they bring all the Czech, they, they capture all the Czech tanks and they bring them into the uh, into their Panzer units uh, to replace those that have been lost. There's about 5,000 other vehicles, uh, close to 600 aircraft, uh, and so uh, this was this was hard. This was considered by many in the Wehrmacht to be uh, one of their toughest campaigns until the Russian until the invasion of, of Russia. Um, but also significant is that this was not simply a military campaign, but also uh, the start of genocide. Uh, this is really the start of what we think of uh, with, with the, the term the Germans used as uh, Volkssturmkampf or race war. Uh, this was not just a war against the military force, this was a war against civilians. Um, in, the, in the invasion of France and, and Belgium in 1940, uh, German forces commit about 25 massacres of civilians and POWs, so about, about 25. Uh, in 1939, uh, the Germans commit between five and 600 massacres of civilians. Uh, so come on a completely different scale. Um, if you studied the Holocaust, you, you know about the role of the Einsatzgruppen or special action groups uh, that uh, following Operation Barbarossa follow the German forces and begin massacres of Jews and, and others in, uh, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Einsatzgruppen were pioneered in Poland. They're, this was their, their test run of the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, they, they followed the German forces. They had lists of poles that they were going to shoot. Uh, they killed many POWs, defenders of the Gdańsk post office, 
are all shot except for a few that managed to escape, including the, the 12 year old daughter of the, uh, of the postmaster uh, who happened to be uh, in, in the post office uh, is, is, uh, is burned alive with a flamethrower uh, and left to die untreated for two weeks uh, uh, in, in a hospital bed. Uh, 200,000 civilians are, are killed, at least 200,000 civilians. That, that's not talking about what the Soviets did uh, because the Soviets commit numerous massacres uh, as well as they invade. Uh, it's not talking about later killings that take place after the, after the conflict. Uh, so this is estimated, estimated 200,000. Um, and a lot of the, 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 the background of this uh, is still not very well known. It's still being investigated. Um, just to give you an example, this is a site near Warsaw. Uh, there was this kind of less than a month ago, uh, and uh, uh, believes that there are victims that were killed uh, right at the end of the campaign or possibly a few days later, uh, and uh, near Yawawenka. And uh, about between 25 and 50 uh, uh, bodies. Uh, they appear to be civilians. There are, there are definitely uh, uh, women's items have been uncovered, uh, but they don't know the full extent. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the, uh, Poland has become actually a leading, a leading expert in, in mass grave identification uh, and forensic archaeology. Uh, this is just one example of, of many. But uh, the struggle does not end. Uh, the Polish forces are reconstituted first in France, then in, in England uh, under the leadership of General Władysław Sikorski. Uh, and, uh, uh, as I said, the, throughout, throughout the war, um, the, the, the Germans had felt that they may have felt that they had destroyed the Polish forces, but again and again, they'll meet the Poles, they'll meet them in, in uh, the fjords of Norway, they'll meet them in North Africa, uh, in the forests of Eastern Europe, in Normandy, in Italy, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, one of the first uh, Allied ships to make a, a direct contact with the, the Bismarck as it's attempting to escape is the Polish destroyer Piorun. Uh, the Polish agents around the world uh, worked thwart uh, German ambitions. When the, when the Germans send uh, a team of agents to Afghanistan to try to turn Afghanistan into uh, an, an Axis partner, they're thwarted at every turn by a network of Polish agents led by the um, uh, Polish honorary consul uh, Terlewski, who's later given the uh, Order of the British Empire uh, for, for his work in, in stopping uh, German influence in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so really every corner of the globe, uh, the, 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 Poles, the Poles are there. The legacy of 1939 is still with us uh, because it really begins the second world. The Poles did draw in the Western powers. They did succeed, even though they were themselves defeated. Uh, Poland loses its independence uh, and is then turned over to the Soviet Union uh, at the end of the war uh, until uh, the, the end of communism in 19, uh, 1989. Uh, but the, the war uh, shows us the way, this is the, the indicator of how this war is going to be conducted, not merely a military campaign, uh, but a, a war against, uh, a terrible war against civilians, uh, really the, the start of the eliminationist phase of the Holocaust really begins here in 1939. Uh, but it also shows the determination of, uh, of many peoples in Europe, not just the Poles, but uh, uh, to resist Hitler, uh, regardless of the consequences uh, and regardless of the losses. Uh, it, it shows the way to what will be a new form of warfare uh, conducted in Europe. Uh, maybe not the, the first there's a debate over whether it's the first example of Blitzkrieg or not, uh, but it's certainly the, one of the first major applications of it. Uh, and so um, it's a campaign that really helps to shape the German army uh, and, and what, what it will become uh, often for the worse uh, in, in years to come. A lot of the weaknesses of the German army uh, become manifest. The Germans, as I mentioned, lost the location of two major Polish armies in 1939, and they, they won, uh, but uh, German military intelligence will continue to have problems. Uh, it wasn't a fatal, it wasn't a fatal flaw in 19, uh, 1939, but in 1942, outside of Stalingrad, the Germans lose track of Soviet buildup outside of Stalingrad. They don't spot uh, the Red Army forces massing on the flanks of the German Sixth Army, and that was a fatal mistake. So a lot of the, uh, the, the problems that the Germans have later in the war that come back to haunt them are already visible here in 1939. It was a very important campaign. 
uh, and hopefully uh, we can uh, dispel some of the myths uh, and honor those who, who, uh, who served uh, in that campaign as well. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to my, uh, my, my co, uh, my co uh, presenters uh, and they can discuss their, uh, their portion of it. I, I want to thank uh, Andrew Nagorski. Uh, he is, uh, uh, his, uh, his family uh, was in Poland when the war started. And uh, Andy has uh, been to Minnesota, I think, Andy, three times on your books. And this is your second time on Zoom with us. And uh, I, I think um, you can add some personal stories of your family involved in this attack that, uh, that John has done such a great job of uh, introducing to us. Yes, thank you, Donna. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Uh, and thanks to John for that uh, terrific overview. Um, it, it's, uh, I grew up in a Polish family and I'll tell you a little bit about it. And uh, so I heard bits and pieces of this story, but that was, uh, you tied that all together in a way that I think makes, makes sense of it in a way that a lot of people don't, don't usually get. Uh, I just, yeah, so that's the big picture. Uh, Don asked me to talk about my dad, especially in, in my family story. It's not, I'd say, first of all, and my dad would have said this too, uh, it's not an extraordinary story for a Polish family. It's not, it, it, it is just one of many. If you go to Poland, you would find stories like this all over the place. And, and my dad certainly never felt it was extraordinary. Uh, but he, here in brief, here, here's what happened. Uh, my parents grew up in Poland before the war. My parents married in 38, right before the, the year before the war. And my father was studying law he, and he was a reserve, junior, what he called a cadet officer. I think he said, that he, I mean, I think we, you probably considered it like a second lieutenant, although he said it, he, he had the equivalent of sergeant stripes. And in, when that mobilization happened that John mentioned, he was called up. And he was in an armored unit, and they didn't know where they were going. First, the train started going west, to, as if towards the German border. Then it went east, and it ended up in the city of Brest in eastern Poland. Uh, and there, they unloaded the tanks that for a tank platoon that my father was in charge of. The tanks, and this is this is the I think one of the relevant pieces of information were World War I French Renault tanks. They had been bought by the Poles from the French because the French were basically dumping it from their arsenal and, and getting it cheap. And as John said, the Polish government between the wars did not have a lot of money. And when my father asked, well, what's the top speed of these tanks? It was about eight to 10 kilometers per hour, basically five or six miles per hour. And they, they were supposed to defend the citadel in Brest, which is a medieval citadel, with these tanks that were going to come under attack from German panzers. So as you could tell, the chances of them succeeding were very small. And first of all, the Germans unleashed a tremendous amount of firepower, and my father describes how he he and his men were simply hiding under their tanks while the shelling continued. And then at times they would get into their tanks and try to try to try to have forays, but it but it was very ineffective. And my father always felt that uh, there's nothing heroic here to talk about. Uh, and uh, he also said, you know, he remembers at one point when he thought they the, the, the frontal assault on the Citadel was coming. He fired off some rounds from his tank. And later he heard that some of his own men had been injured in shelling, which he began to worry, was he responsible for friendly fire? So one of the things that became clear to me over the years when my, when my dad would just dribble out parts of these stories, but he had a real sense of survivor's guilt. Uh, and he would always say we were, we as a family were very lucky in that at least he, he, he and my mother and, and his parents survived. 
But uh, yeah, there were others I'll mention in a moment who did not. But uh, it's the circumstances were always, it was confusing. Uh, and when in September 17th, when the Soviets attacked from the east, they knew the battle was, was up. Uh, they were, everyone basically was told, get out of here. They actually burned their, those tanks and the men started heading towards Warsaw or other places. They were told to, to just disappear. The Germans were, were putting out orders that German, Polish soldiers were supposed to turn themselves into, into German POW camps or be shot. He and a few of his men decided not to. And he actually got back to Warsaw thinking he would find out whether his, anyone from his family was still there. In fact, uh, my, his parents and my mother had already left because his father was a fairly well-known lawyer who was part of a group of, of Poles who, were, who had been sent out early in the fighting through Romania to get to France to form the Polish government in exile that was mentioned by John. Uh, so he had no idea exactly where they were, but assumed they had, were heading to France. He gets to, Paul, to, to his house in Warsaw. And my grandfather was a well-educated man and he had spent time actually in Germany before World War I studying and doing his doctoral thesis. Uh, he was expelled from the university for Polish nationalist activities. But uh, he, at a certain point, uh, a, a, a German patrol of three young officers came into the house and looked at my dad and realized he's a military age. What's he doing there? And my father gave a very lame story about being, yes, he had been, he had been discharged, he was disabled, which was not true. Uh, but, but luckily there were a lot of, there were a number of books in German on, on the bookshelves including my grandfather's thesis in German. And the German, the German sold, this group of German soldiers were very impressed with this by, at first. And they said, let him off with a warning, but he realized this is not gonna let next time, it might be the SS or someone else. He, he felt they had to get out of there. And he and a buddy started, uh, a, a started a journey south to get to what was then the Hungarian border with Poland to get out and with the idea of getting to France. He already there were fake papers being produced to get young men like my father out to rejoin Polish forces. Uh, they went, he managed to go part way on those false papers on, on, by train, then mostly on foot. Uh, and, and at one point they, they get to the border and, that, and they're told by the villagers there are there are German unions patrolling all over the place who are rounding up uh, escaping soldiers, sometimes shooting them summarily, already are throwing them in, in camps. And they were wondering how to get through there. And at that point, a young peasant boy said, I will get you through. I know, I know this terrain very well. And they took it on faith that he was for real, and he was. And he got him through, got him across the border. Uh, and uh, by the way, two months later, my father learned through the grapevine that that same young boy was caught with some other Polish soldiers and they were all executed, including the young boy. And then again, this is my father saying, you know, those were the true heroes. You know, I just benefited from their bravery. Uh, he, gets to, he gets to Hungary, then manages to go through Yugoslavia, gets to France, and then those Polish units are re regrouping he, because he, he joins his, his, his unit and, and actually reconnects with his parents and, and his wife, his young, young bride. And then when France falls, uh, he, the Polish units there are, are evacuated to Britain along, you know, it wasn't just Dunkirk, there were a lot of other troops that went, including Polish troops. And my mother was determined to go with him all the way and not, not to be separated again. And he told the story of how they, there was a Polish ship that was going to evacuate them to Britain, but uh, there were a couple of British officers, young officers who were checking the papers and identities of people going on. So 
he, the guys in his unit dressed up my mother in a, in, in a uniform of a soldier and put on a helmet, a small helmet, and uh, try, tried to hide her hair. And she's going up the gangplank, and one of one of the British uh, British soldiers say, "Watch your step, ma'am." So he managed. They managed to get out together. He gets to Britain, uh, and then he eventually ends up in a Polish paratrooper unit, the training in Scotland. It's the same paratrooper unit that some of you have seen. I'm sure the a bridge too far that much later in the war. Uh, is dropped into Arnhem in horrible circumstances and has horrible casualties. Uh, they, they, they was one, a very poorly planned drop by the British, their British superiors. But again, my father lucks out basically. He says uh, I was earlier, he had been, they, they'd realized he was a pretty good writer uh, and he, uh, they had had him writing them some things for the Polish forces for the Polish army newspaper and so he did not make the drop that day, and which is probably why I'm around to tell his story. Uh, he, so he, later on, he went in with his unit into occupied Germany, all of that. So it's, you have that story and he manages to survive. My parents managed to survive. My, his parents managed to survive. My mother does. But just to put it in perspective, for instance, when I was 17, my mother took me to the Polish cemetery in Normandy went to the grave of her favorite cousin who had died with Polish forces in Normandy in the second wave of the, of the D-Day invasion when Polish troops went in. Uh, and there's a large Polish cemetery there. Uh, a, a couple other family stories. Uh, my, my grandfather, one of my grandfather's brothers was a pretty well-known architect in Warsaw. He stayed there throughout the war during the Warsaw Uprising in 1944, at a certain point, the, German, the Germans were just in, in retaliation for, for, for military action by Polish uh, resistance, were just grabbing people and, and lighting up and shooting them. He was caught in one of these rounds up, roundups and shot. And, and one other brother from that, from that family uh, it got to Britain and was on a ship called the Benares which went from Britain to Canada in 1940. And, and there were about 400 people on the ship, including 90 British children who were, who were being sent to Canada to avoid the Blitz. And that ship was torpedoed in the mid Atlantic. And of the about more than half of the people died and 77 of the 90 children died. My, my, my great uncle, who, who was one of the ones who was lucky enough to survive, was given up for dead. His lifeboat was out there floating for several days in the mid-Atlantic, and his wife had already been told that he, he, was, he was gone, and then he showed up. So, you know, war, as we all know, is a strange thing. Who survives, who doesn't? Uh, and uh, I think in Poland, there are certainly a lot of heroic stories, as in many places, there are a lot of stories where you just sort of wonder, it went one way, it could have gone the other way. Uh, and it does make you sort of reflect on, on the, the vicissitudes of all this. I also later on married a Polish woman. My wife is Polish. Uh, I was an exchange student in Poland. Uh, her mother and her father both were young teenagers when the war started and were taken away for slave labor uh, my my mother-in-law ended up as a 16-year-old in an Ericsson uh, factory in Vienna uh, where they were making field phones for the Wehrmacht, for the German military. And my, my father-in-law was, was taken off to a farm someplace in Germany to work the farm since all the young men were, were off in uniform. Uh, so... If you go to any, you know, and there are many countries where this is true, but particularly in Poland, given the percentage of people who were either killed or imprisoned or so forth, you will find stories like one story like this after the other. And uh, I'm glad we're having an evening like this where at least some of them can be remembered. Thank you. Our uh, final speaker this evening is uh, Dorothea Johns, the wife of uh, Jim Johns, who many of us in the uh, 
history element in the Twin Cities know Jim. Uh, Dorothea has a co very compelling story to tell, and uh, we're going to get her situated here just momentarily. I can get her. I can get her. Yep. Yep. I'm okay. I have some back issues, so I have to be careful the way I sit. I'm okay. Good. You got it. I got it. I don't know about this. After watching that, I'm almost ashamed to say I'm a German. I feel really, really bad what the Germans did, and to see it like that is is horrible, but it was a war. Uh, I was born in the extreme eastern part of Silesia, Germany, which is now in Poland. I was born in a little town called Stefansdorf, which is now called Szczepano. Uh, we consisted of Five kids, my dad was in the German Luftwaffe as a reservist. He did not, and I suppose every German said that, but he did not like Hitler. He did not believe in him. He would not join the Nazi party, although he was in the reserves, and he went to reserve meetings once a month, and. He he, his job description was airplane spotter. He was, when he was in the war, he had to go ahead and identify the different airplanes that flew over. That was his job description. Our family consisted of five children, my mom and dad. My dad was a furniture maker in this little town and he was good at his job. He also made the coffins for everybody. Uh, he joined the reserve and w also joined it with the mayor of the town. I think it was their way of satisfying the Nazi regime so that they were doing something and they couldn't say, well, they didn't love their country. But my, hus my husband too. <laughs> my father did not like what he said after the war, Schickel Gruber. He did not like him. Uh, Dad was called up in 1939 as a reservist for the invasion of Poland. He was gone about a month and then he was home again. Uh, I don't know how far he got into Poland. I don't know if he made it to Warsaw or not. But after he came home again, it was Everything as usual, go back to work, take care of the family. And then he was called up again in 19, um, I think it was, uh, was 41, the Operation uh, Barbarossa. He was called up for that. He came back many times. Well, he would have had to because there were three kids born in between there. <laughs> from 1939 until 1944. And by the way, we get, it, it's a big joke in our family that my little brother who was born on the 4th of July, his name is Wolfgang. But they always teased him because he was a 4th of July baby and how would he, on the fourth, born on the 4th of July, who would have ever thought that we'd be living in the United States and celebrating it? Uh, my dad came home, like I said, Christmas of 1944, after he'd been gone, come home, be gone again. And we celebrated Christmas together. And after that, we didn't, I didn't see my dad until 1948. Uh, it was January of 1945. Living in this little town of Sheshapano, we had people coming through with their wagons, horses. Uh, it was like covered wagons they were on. And they kept saying to my mom, 
I think maybe as long as you've got five kids, maybe you ought to pack up and start going to the east because the Russians are right behind us. Well, my mom wasn't about to go ahead and leave her house, but she thought, well, here I've got a six-month-old and the oldest being 12, I think maybe I better go someplace further west. So she packed up two suitcases, got on a train with the five of us, went to her sister's, which was about 200 miles away. Her sister had already packed up. They had packed up on a covered wagon, and they were going to go ahead and what they called, they were making a trek to the west. So we got on this covered wagon, the five kids, her, mother, her sister's family, and the three kids, another lady and her baby, and my mom pushing a baby buggy. And it was the coldest, coldest winter in history, and my mom's pushing a baby buggy across Germany. We got strafed along the way. We, we got put up by people in, uh, in schools, barracks, uh, castles, uh, monasteries, wherever they could put us. And on the way, of course, we didn't have any place to go grocery shopping or what were we going to do for food. But the people knew that their time was going to come, and so they helped us along the way. We'd get, our, we'd get the milk for the baby, and we'd get some rations from people, and so on and so on. Uh, the sleeping at night uh, in all these different places, in straw and hay, all of us kids developed lice. And my mom didn't know what to do with us kids. We were scratching and itching, and we did. And then one night, we got to a castle, and she was really, really having a hard time trying to keep my baby brother dry, trying to get milk for him. And she was to the end of her rope, she said. Uh, she went out to the moat after she had bedded us down, and she thought, OK, one way out. I could go ahead and take my kids while they're sleeping and throw them off the moat and drown them. But my mom had a very, very strong, strong faith. And she said, God told me that what's going to happen when Henry comes home and he ha no longer has a family. So she said, God told me he would take care of me. And she said, I depended upon him the rest of the time, and he did. She says, he led us to safety, and eventually we made it through. Uh, stay, one night, we stayed in a wo German woman's army barracks. And the grown-ups were all inside, and us kids, we were outside, and we were playing, and oh, just watching the beautiful sunset, and it was, the sky was so red, and it was from, it was just beautiful out. We kept telling the parents, come on out, come on out, and see this. Look at the sky. It's just awesome. Well, they weren't about to be moved. They were tired, I guess. So the next day, after we had traveled another whole day, we came to the town of Dresden. Dresden had been firebombed the night before and through the night. We were outside of Dresden, staying outside of Dresden, but you could still, and to this day, I was seven years old at the time, but to this day when somebody talks about a red sky, I can smell ash. Now, if that's all up in my head, I don't know, but I can smell burning. And when we, after we had gotten to Dresden, we saw the, skeletons on trees, uh, scorched bodies, and just, like I said, a stench in the city. Well, my aunt and uncle decided, heck, we've gone through this long enough now. We're not going to go any further. We're going to stay outside of Dresden and see. Maybe the Russians won't get this far. So they stayed outside of Dresden. He got a, he got a, a job on a farm, sheep herding, and 
we got on a train that was headed to the west. And we had no idea where it was going or how far it was going. My mother just said, I've got to get these kids to safety somehow. I've got to get them away from here. So we got on this train. It was a Red Cross train. And uh, we were going to go to the end of the line. So we got strafed along the way. I don't know, by the British or the Americans. The engine was bombed, so we had to wait on the tracks for a new engine to, be co to come. Uh, when we were strafed, uh, I was sitting in the center of the aisle on a suitcase because there, were, there wasn't any room, and my, brothers, my bro older brother and sister were in a separate car, so we were separated. Uh, but when we got strafed, I was sitting next to a lady uh, right here. She was sitting there, and I was sitting on a suitcase. She was sitting on a bench, and of course, I was seven years old. I'd lean against her. And she'd go like this and shove me off the suitcase and I'd fall on the floor. I'd get back on again and like a kid, uh, I, was about, I was not about to lose my seat. So get back on the suitcase again, she did it again. And as we were getting strafed, bullet came, went right through her. She fell off the bench and I looked at my mom and I said, can I sit on her bench now? And mom says, yeah, go ahead. It, it's a kid. I mean, I was, when I think about it now, I think, how could you be like that? But I was seven years old. Uh, when we got to the end of track, like I say now, I, from Western movies, end of track, uh, we were in Bavaria. We were about 20 kilometer, kilometers this side of the Czech border. When we got there, the mayor met us, and he had his duty to go ahead and find housing for all these families. And he said, okay, you're going to go live there. You're going to go ahead and go here. You're going to go ahead and go with all these other people and go to the school, and we'll make room for you there. He sent us to a farmhouse about two miles away. We walked, and it was a long walk, two miles, pushing a baby buggy and two suitcases. And we got to this farm. It was two rooms in a farmhouse with the barn across the way. And my mother had, we had a nice house in Germany. And my, my dad had made beautiful furniture. And here we come into these two rooms with a kitchen table, a stove, a cot, and nothing to sleep on but a mattress. And there were five of us, so two of the kids, the oldest one, Hans and Anne-Marie, had to sleep in the barn. Uh, we lived like that for five years. Uh, while we were living there, this is in February, and of course, then we start getting bombed by the Americans and we would have to flee in the middle of the night. And my mom had something about the forest. Whenever we would get bombed, she'd get us out of bed, get us dressed, and we'd march to the forest, and she'd hide us underneath the trees. I don't know if she thought that was a safe place, but she thought the airplanes couldn't see us. Next morning, we'd go ahead, be marched back in the house again, and along the way, we'd find our slippers and clothes, whatever we had lost, running away. Our town, uh, the city of Calm, got bombed about three, t three different times. Uh, it was, I think, was it April or March when the Americans were coming through, and we were told the Americans were coming. Well, my mom being a, being a, she thought she was a widow. My mom being alone with us five kids, the neighbor next door said, okay, Alfreda, he said, the Americans are coming, he said, and we've heard some real stories about them. So he said, you and the kids come and stay in my house and we'll all sleep downstairs in the basement. He had taken big boulders and, and, uh, and put them in front of the windows so nobody could see in or shoot in. 
And so we spent the night in the basement. Of course, during the night, we had this, we heard this earth shaking, felt the earth shaking, and we didn't know what was happening outside, but we knew something was happening because the earth was shaking. And the next morning, his name was Carl, and he went upstairs, the basement stairway, and went and opened the back door. And of course, us kids, we weren't going to let him go out there alone. We were right behind him. And we went out in the yard, and there, lo and behold, stands this great, big, huge, huge tank. And the, Ar and the Amis, what we called the army, we called them Amis, the Amis were all standing around and they saw us kids, and I think there must have been about nine of us. And the first thing they did was hold out these orange balls wrapped in orange paper, crinkly paper, and gave them to us, and we unwrapped them. And they were oranges. We hadn't seen an orange ever. And then it was the Hershey bars, and then it was the cow gummy, the chewing gum. Well, they gave us chewing gum and, of course, take out a thing and give it to us. And Oh, that tastes sweet. Swallowed it. We did that with all the chewing gum that they gave us. And pretty soon, one of the GIs comes up to us and shows us how to take the paper off and how to take, put it in half, put it in our mouths, and he went, what's that? What's he doing? You know, and we look at him, God, he's chewing like a cow. What's, why is he doing that? And then pretty soon he put it on his tongue and trying to blow a bubble? What the heck, you know? Well, after a few days, we got the hang of it. We got to chew gum. Uh, okay, so the, army's, the army is there now. And we get some rations from them. Uh, during this time, uh, my mom had no job. She had no way of supporting us. The only way we survived was cleaning the fields, potato fields, stealing fruit, uh, stealing eggs from the farmers. Uh, it was us kids. We were like little hellions. I mean, we had to go out and find food, find mushrooms. Uh, my mom took berries off the trees. We didn't know if they, were, if they were poison or not, but she made syrup out of it to go ahead and put something on the, uh, on the bread. And then she found a field with sugar beets, and then she boiled those, and we had syrup to put on our bread. Another way she supported us were by us kids walking behind the armies. I call them armies walking behind the Amis and finding their cigarette butts, bringing them home. Mom would go ahead and peel off the paper, put it in a little can, save the tobacco, take it to the black market, and come back with maybe some butter or some milk, whatever. Then she started doing the laundry for the GIs. She would go ahead and, of course, no washing machine, no dryer, uh, she had to pump the water. She washed the stuff during the day, hung it up to dry in the kitchen during the night. The next day she would iron with an iron that was heated on the stove and get the, ar get the army uniforms all pressed. I remember the three creases in the back of the shirt and oh, the creases down here. She did a beautiful job. And my older brother, Hans and Anna Marie, would take it down to the barracks where the guys were living, the, ar the army guys, and they would go ahead and pay her with rations like coffee or Crisco or uh, other goodies, and she would take it at the black market. And that's how she fed us. I mean, this, this went on for many, many years like this. My, my sister finally got a job. She was 14, she got a job in a parachute factory where they took the old parachutes and made lingerie out of the parachutes. So, so she helped support us. Then it was time for her to be, she was 14, she was supposed to get confirmed. My mom had no dress for her, uh, no clothing because we lost everything. 
and she went to the church. And by the way, Bavaria is strictly Catholic. And here we were, the people from the East, and we were Protestant. She was supposed to get confirmed, and she went to the, past, the pars parsonage, and they had gotten care packages from the, the states. And the pastor said, go through the packages. Maybe you can find a dress for her. Well, she found a little black dress. Inside the dress, there was a little slip of paper attached to it and said, this is coming from Hamburg, Minnesota. Uh, we are the Rolfs, Carl and Bertha. And write to us, correspond with us. We'd like to know who got this dress. My mom started writing to them. And pretty soon, they were a a uh, couple with no children, they wanted to adopt the two youngest ones. And my mom thought about it and thought about it for a long time, but then she decided, no, when Henry comes home, he's gonna say what happened to the other two kids. <laughs> so she said, no, I better keep my family together. And she said, well, maybe when Henry comes home, maybe we can all come to America. But these people sent a lot of care packages with peanut butter, lots of goodies that we really, really enjoyed and that we needed. And coffee, Crisco, uh, hot chocolate, things like that, cocoa, was good for the black market that she could go ahead and get money for it and buy other things that we needed. Uh, my dad, was gone all this time, and we had no idea, was he dead, was he alive? Uh, my mom was in touch with her brother, who worked for the Red Cross. And he, my dad found, my dad found my uncle. And he sent my dad a note that we were safe and in Bavaria. And we got the first letter, I think, in 1947, that my dad was captured by the Russians, put on a labor farm, working in Czechoslovakia. Now, we're living in Bavaria. Czechoslovakia, right outside of Prague, was about 250 miles away. That's how close we were, and we never knew that my dad was living. Uh, my dad wrote to us, and then, they let him go because he had contacted pneumonia. And so they sent him home, and with the help of the Americans uh, giving him penicillin, he pulled through. Uh, from 48 to 49, my dad worked as a cabinet maker again, and by then, the people in the United States in Hamburg sponsored us and had us come over here. Uh, that should be the end of the story, <laughs> but it isn't. Uh, these people that sponsored us, they didn't sponsor us for the love of God or for the love of us, but they sponsored us to make money off of us. They took advantage of my dad, gave him a job, had him work for them, pay back every penny and every package that they ever sent for us, sent to us. Uh, my dad practically went on his knees and said, I'd like to become independent. I don't want to work for you anymore. I, would, I think I can make a good living. But the man said, no, you're working for me. I had you come over here. And he says, you're going to work for me. But the neighbor in Hamburg went to my dad and said, Henry, if you want to come in, become independent, I'll give you the money, build your own house, become independent, and get out from under him, which my dad did. And the man and his wife had the audacity to go to the pastor in town and say, look, this is what's happening here. Henry and his wife are so ungrateful Look what I all did for them. And now they want to become independent and more or less shun us. And the pastor said, I think, Carl, I'm going to turn the tables on you. I've heard enough, he said. I am not going to go ahead and give you communion for a while until you learn 
because what you're doing to these people is wrong. And so my dad became independent, built a house. My dad died at the age of 75. And when my dad died, he had a house, he had a cabin, he had a workshop, he had a wonderful, wonderful reputation. Uh, everything was paid for. And he had two sons that served in the US military, one for 21 years, one for three years, and they all brought wives home from Germany. <laughs> so that's kind of my story. And I am married to Jim Johns, who is always on this program. And when we got married, and we've been married 63 years, uh, we, oh yeah. Uh, when we got married, Jim got stationed back in Bavaria, Germany. And I got to go with him. And when I went back to Germany, oh, by the way, when I left, when I left to come to the United States, my teacher said, you don't want to go to, you don't want to go to America. He said, you're not going to go on this big boat across this big ocean. And you know, he says, your ship might sink. So when I got back to Germany and Jim went out in the fields, I went back to my hometown and I went to visit my teacher and I said, here I am, ship didn't sink. Stay here. Uh, we're we're going to do some uh, Q&A. Can you pull up, uh, Doug, can you pull up uh, uh, John and uh, Andy? Uh -uh. Uh, well, this is a, a question for John. And I guess one of the things uh, about Paul I, I, I remember is that it's had this very effective resistance, the home army, and which I know is involved in the Warsaw uprising. Could you sort of okay. give a background on how the Home Army came about, who organized it, and uh, sort of how, how it was able to operate in occupied Poland? Okay, thank you. Um, and the question is about, for those who may not heard, the question is about the, the Polish Home Army, the AKA, uh, Armia Krajowa, uh, which was the main Polish resistance group. And uh, Don has promised that I'll come back and talk about the AKA and the Warsaw Uprising in more detail. Uh, but it was formed uh, really from 1939 with the defeat uh, of the Polish Armed Forces. Uh, resistance began right away. Uh, it was quite a number of resistance groups that formed uh, partisan groups, but also underground groups. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, there were already people producing secret documents, uh, helping people get out. Uh, the Poles had a long tradition of conspiratorial activities uh, and uh, uh, under the Russians and under the Germans, uh, so that, that tradition continued. Uh, in, um, uh, in about 19, well, in 1942, 1943, uh, the, uh, the Home Army was a uh, an attempt to get all the different resistance groups together under one umbrella. Um, and so all, all the main resistance groups, with the exception of the communists, who are a very small group, uh, and, and a group uh, on the right called the National Armed Forces, uh, the Home Army had the, the, uh, the bulk of the Polish resistance. Uh, and it was, an un it was a government, it was a secret government. Uh, it wasn't simply to fight back against the Germans, although that was an important part but also to uh, resist uh, German efforts to destroy the culture, uh, destroy the law. Um, so they, it was a very comprehensive organization um, and uh, provided a lot of uh, uh, not only direct resistance to the Germans, uh, sabotaging train lines uh, going to the Eastern Front, for example, uh, but also a lot of intelligence gathering uh, and uh, uh, intelligence on the Holocaust uh, quite a bit, but also uh, the, uh, the German secret weapons, the V2, uh, the Home Army got a, uh, managed to capture a V2 that had gone off, uh, off course. Uh, and parts of that, along with complete technical drawings, were, were smuggled out to England uh, uh, by, by secret, uh, secret aircraft courier during the war. Uh, so very, very large, very effective intelligence organization. But a topic that uh, we could talk about for, uh, for, for uh, quite some time, and hopefully I'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about Frantic 7 uh, and, the, and the uprising and the, and the Polish resistance. 
Well, listen, I promised Doug and the crew that we would end up. There's a curfew thing. It's getting close to 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. It'll take us a while to get out of here. And, and, and Tom, Tom, I want you to ha help uh, Dorothea up the elevator. Sure. So why don't, why don't okay. you... Uh, but Dorothea, Andy, John, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming out. And be careful going home. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.